afternoon from London. I know we have a global audience joining us today, so good morning, good afternoon or good evening wherever you are joining us from. And welcome to this webinar, Staying on Track, How to Fund Infrastructure Projects as Government Borrowing Costs Rise. I'm Siobhan Benita, I'm a former UK civil servant. I'm delighted to be chairing this webinar on behalf of Global Government Forum, which is a publishing house that serves civil servants all around the world and with our knowledge partner today at Deloitte. So in terms of today's topic, um, in the face of big challenges ranging from climate change to connectivity and building economies back after the pandemic, many governments around the world are increasing their investment in infrastructure with a particular focus on green and digital uh, projects. But after a decade or more of low interest rates on government debt, High inflation has led to an increase in interest rates by central banks in a number of countries, which is pushing up the cost of borrowing for governments. So this has led to a renewed look in some countries at different ways and other means to fund large projects. The World Bank, for example, has produced guidance on the use of public-private partnerships in infrastructure post-COVID. In today's webinar, we're gonna look at all the factors that governments should be considering when examining funding options and discuss some of the best practice in unlocking investment. We have a fantastic panel with us here today. Um, I'm going to introduce them in a minute and they're going to give us some opening remarks. But once we've heard from our panel members, it's your opportunity as our audience to put your questions to this expert panel. So please do make the most of that opportunity. Whichever device you are using, you should see somewhere on the screen a Q&A function. You can use that Q&A function to send in your questions and please do that from any time, any time from now on. But without further ado, let me introduce our great panel. So first we'll hear from Ian Brown, who is Head of Banking and Investments at the UK Infrastructure Bank. With a long career in investment and commercial banking, Ian recently joined the UK Infrastructure Bank, where he leads a team focused on providing debt, equity and guarantees in support of UK infrastructure projects that have the potential to help the UK meet its net zero targets and or stimulate economic growth. Then we'll head over to the United States, where we're going to hear from Chris Creed, who is Senior Advisor at the Loan Programs Office, which is part of the Department of Energy in the United States. Chris is focused on assisting the department's efforts to make available loans and loan guarantees to first of a kind projects and other high impact energy related ventures. Prior to joining the DOE, Chris was at Goldman Sachs and has spent more than two decades in the mortgage and securitized markets as both a portfolio manager and a trader. Then we'll hear from our knowledge partner representative today. So that's Michael Flynn, who is global infrastructure, transport and regional government sector leader for Deloitte. In this role, Michael leads the global team that's focused on public sector investment in infrastructure, transport and mobility, climate and environment, and regional and local governments. We've had Michael on our webinars before. It's really good to have you back again with us here today, Michael. And last, but by no means least, we'll hear from Alexandra Carnaro, who is a director at Department of Development and Infrastructure in the Ministry of Infrastructure in Brazil. Alexandra is a financial expert with experience in leading positions across the Brazilian government. And in his current position, he's responsible for privatizations and the financeability of public-private partnerships projects. That's a real tongue twister, that one. So I'm sure you'll agree, we have a really stellar panel with us here today. As I say, please do take this opportunity to message in your questions. But for now, I'm gonna invite Ian to give us his opening remarks. Over to you, Ian. Thanks very much, everyone, um, and hello to everybody. Um, I want to just start with talking a little bit about the UK Infrastructure Bank. Um, we're fairly new. Um, we're a government-owned policy bank, um, and our focus is increasing infrastructure investment across the UK. So we're hopefully front and centre of, of today's topics. Um, our creation was announced uh, back in 2020 as part of the government's national infrastructure strategy. Um, and we went live just over 12 months ago. And in that time, we've uh, we've undertaken 12 deals. Ten of those have been announced um, across a variety of sectors, and, and we might talk about some of those later on. Um, I say we're owned by the government, uh, by the Treasury, um, but we're operationally independent. Um, so there's a series of framework documents that set out 
uh, how we can operate, but we make our own investment decisions, we make our own uh, marketing decisions. Um, so we, we are truly arm's length. Um, and our purpose um, is to partner with the private sector and local government. Um, thank you, Raquel. Um, to increase infrastructure investment. And, and we're focused on, on really two areas. Um, one is tackling climate change. So if the project um, is intended to help reduce uh, emissions, um, then it definitely qualifies for us to look at. Um, and the other is supporting uh, regional and local economic growth in the UK, um, hopefully through improving connectivity, improving uh, employment opportunities, uh, and improving productivity. And I mentioned partner, uh, partnering a minute ago. Um, that's a really important word for us because uh, the whole ethos is that we want to crowd in, not crowd out, um, so that we're not uh, uh, pushing other people out. If we're competing with anybody, frankly, we shouldn't be doing the deal if other people are prepared to do it. It's important that we use uh, public money to best effect. Um, our, our capacity uh, headline number is 22 billion, um, which Seems like a lot of money until I saw Chris's figures, but I suppose we've got different economies. Um, and uh, we break that down. We've got eight billion for debt and equity. Uh, we've got uh, ten billion available um, for guarantees, and we've carved out four billion pounds um, for local authority uh, activity. And very importantly, uh, we can operate across the entire capital structure. So uh, the, the bank is is largely indifferent when we first start looking at a project as to whether it's debt or equity or maybe we're offering a, a, a wrapper a guarantee for something uh, but we do need to keep an eye on the mix of our portfolio and i expect the reality is we'll end up doing more senior debt um, than we will equity um, but also we can be hopefully uh, intelligent about how we use our money so for example one one way we might um, and we'll touch on this later i'm sure but one way we might unlock projects for people um, is rather than just providing senior debt alongside everybody else, we could provide a sliver of mezzanine, for example, um, that changes the, the, the profile for the second loss banks and, and therefore hopefully should, should crowd in more people. Um, we assess our investments across four key principles. Um, <clears throat> the first is that we should be, whatever we do, should be driving regional or local economic growth, as I mentioned, um, or supporting climate change. So that's absolutely fundamental. Uh, secondly, it needs to, the money needs to be going into infrastructure assets or networks, um, or indeed into new infrastructure technology, and, and that's a lot of what we're looking at at the moment is, is first of a kind nascent technologies, um, and, and again, hopefully helping to open up or accelerate those markets by, by getting involved and, and, and showing our comfort with the, with the particular technology in question. Um, <clears throat> we might be an arm of government, but we do need to um, provide a positive financial return. Um, that may not be as demanding as some financial institutions, but we need a positive financial return. And very importantly, as I mentioned, we need to be um, crowding in capital um, over time. So we've got a couple of what we think are our, our USPs. Um, we can uh, take more risk if we need to, if that, if that helps us to uh, particularly to identify, uh, well, helps us to fill a gap that we might have identified in, in the financing, uh, or it might help us to accelerate uh, a rollout of a technology, for example. Um, we're very flexible uh, about where we can sit in the cap structure. And as I mentioned, we're, we're, we're here to partner. We're not here to compete with people to crowd out. We're here to partner. Um, and so far, the experience has been very encouraging there with, with working with um, other lenders. Um, and then lastly, uh, we're here to hopefully provide practical and, uh, and thought leadership um, on transactions. We're having a lot of conversations at the moment about you know, how, to, how, to, how to structure uh, Financings on on uh, assets that have never been financed before, at least not in the UK. Sometimes not globally, um, and that's I would not that incredibly interesting work. Um, but that's you know, front and centre of what we're trying to do is to help create financing markets and get those moving. That's me for now, Siobhan. Thanks so much, Ian. A great way to kick off uh, the conversation. Really interesting to hear kind of why you were set up your governance arrangements uh, owned by government but operationally uh, independent. Um, the obje objectives that you have around uh, tackling climate change and supporting local and regional growth, that levelling up agenda really important yes. uh, in the UK. And then um, what you said there about your principles, but also the USP. So why is there a need for what you do? Where do you sit? 
in kind of that landscape. So, um, you know, able to take more risks, more flexible, the partnerships that you develop. And then really interesting what you said about looking ahead, that longer term piece on thought leadership as well. Thank you so much, Ian. Great to have that as our opening um, presentation. Chris, I'm coming over to you. Thanks, Siobhan. Really appreciate it. And thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, chat with uh, with um, uh, your group here. It's uh, it's um, uh, extremely important for us to, to be talking as much as possible about uh, the work that we're doing to help bring in, whether it be applicants or whether it be cooperations with other countries. So definitely appreciate the opportunity. Very similar to the way that Ian described the UK Infrastructure Bank, the Department of Energy's Loan Programs Office has a very similar mandate. Um, uh, uh, created in... Uh, uh, the early part of the 2000s and heavily utilized during the financial crisis of, uh, of the previous decade, um, the Loan Programs Office uh, has a number of different uh, objectives. One is to provide first-of-a-kind financing for commercial deployment of clean energy technologies. Uh, we also have another loan program that is designed to help spur uh, the manufacturing of advanced transportation vehicles as well as a uh, program that has helped um, uh, spur energy investment in uh, Native American tribes and uh, Alaskan land. Um, those were the three sort of pro original programs. And um, until the bipartisan infrastructure legislation of last year and the Inflation Reduction Act of this year were the only programs that, 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 that we administered. And to date, we had given something like $38 billion in uh, loans or loan guarantees, and we have an outstanding portfolio of around 17 or 18 billion. Historically, the loan programs office has had uh, quite a lot of success. Our cumulative loss rate on that portfolio is about 3.3%. And um, the at time of origination rating using sort of S&P rating methodology on our loans was in the high single B, low double B area. So these were definitely speculative grade loans that were uh, designed to help spur uh, the investment at the time that they were made. And so relative to that ex ante rating, um, the performance of the portfolio has been, has been frankly too good. We were probably overly conservative given, uh, given, that, given that formulation. Under the current administration, under President Biden and Secretary Granholm, we have a number of objectives. The first, of the, the first two are sort of our climate objectives. We have our 2035 objective of being net uh, carbon neutral in the production of electricity, and our 2050 objective, which is to be net climate neutral as a country. In addition to those climate objectives, we have our Justice 40 initiative, where the federal government as a, as a whole, but all the credit lending agencies uh, as well, are looking at ways to correct historical underinvestment in certain communities. And so as we look towards the deployment of capital going forward, how can we invest in communities that have been historically underinvested in as a nation? And then finally, um, build back better, high quality American jobs, American commercialization, whatever you whatever whatever uh, phrase you want to use, we're looking to um, uh, make sure that uh, we are helping provide the accelerant or leverage capital to um, have the energy related job growth occur here in the United States. And so that's the sort of high level framework that we were operating. The bipartisan infrastructure legislation of last year uh, added some new structure around our office. It added some new loan programs. It loosened some of the requirements of our programming. And the Inflation Reduction Act gave us significantly expanded uh, lending authority and operating budget to, uh, to lend that. Um, so roughly speaking, uh, prior to those uh, acts passing, we had something like 40 billion of remaining uh, loan authority. The IRA gave us something like $100 billion of additional lending authority on top of that. I wish I could give you exact numbers, but as I'm sure you know, government accounting and, trans and translating that into loan authority is a uh, art, not a science. And then the Inflation Reduction Act added a potentially very powerful new lending authority to our um, arsenal, the Energy Infrastructure 
uh, reinvestment loan program, which was a $250 billion program to help repurpose, retool, replace, reinsert your other verb there. Um, as we look to update, upgrade our aging energy infrastructure. So if you have energy infrastructure, come to us and we'll look to uh, help you finance your next project or your retooling or your replacing project. As we look at deploying all of these uh, authorities, new and old, we have a very similar objective that Ian described, which is it would be very disappointing if all we did was provide debt leverage to make a widget factory and a widget factory appeared. We should try to solve the problem. Why aren't the broad capital markets financing the widget factory? And so as we think about not only the way in which we deploy uh, this extremely important once in a generation investment in the clean energy economy, we also are very thoughtful about how do we catalyze the deployment of clean energy capital broadly from the capital markets. And so we often talk about these sort of pathways to commercialization, and we've identified something like 21 different technologies, each of which we, we would like to get to $100 billion scale by 2035. And whilst I appreciate Ian uh, commenting that uh, you know Congress has given us an enormous uh, responsibility and a lot of money to deploy that, we do not have all of the money to do all of that ourselves. We have to catalyze the broad capital markets. And so the metaphor we, we use is this idea of a bridge to bankability. And we're trying to help show the broad capital markets how to deploy capital in this way by de-risking certain components of these technologies. Whether that be the first of a kind deployment technology risk, or it's less technology risk as it is scale up of technology risk. This isn't like, will the widget work? This is if I was making one widget in a demonstration facility, and now I'm making a thousand widgets a day in a commercial deployment uh, facility, making sure that that scale up works with the operational leverage that, that one would need to make it profitable. That's the kind of uh, technology risk that I think that the broad capital markets are are uncomfortable with funding. Um, and as we think about, broadly speaking, what are the different pathways to get to $100 billion scale across all of these, um, all of these technologies, helping to understand what the constraints are can help us as we're designing our programming, not only at the Loan Programs Office, which is basically just debt, but our other offices at the Department of Energy, namely our Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations, which has more authority in the form of grants, cooperative agreements, other transaction authorities uh, to sort of solve problems such that when we look back in 2025, 26, 27, um, we have created an opportunity for the broad capital markets also to follow on and further invest in these very important technologies because back to the objectives, they're going to create uh, the, um, uh, the, the foundation for us to achieve our 2035 and 2050 climate goals. They're going to be great investments in communities across the United States, and they're going to provide great jobs and be the economic backbone for the clean energy economy that's coming forward. So that's the, that's the overall programming, and we are super excited to be right in the middle of it. And uh, again, definitely appreciate the opportunity to chat about what we're doing here. Brilliant. Thanks, Chris. Really great to get your uh, kind of perspective what you're doing over there in the states uh, interesting to hear about your um, objectives there so that kind of meeting your carbon neutral targets that you've got but also that justice 40 initiative that you were talking about correcting those under investment historical under invest uh, investment in particular communities a bit similar to the leveling up in the uk i would say in kind of an equitable um, kind of look at the investment and then just that general as well helping to build back better and getting those energy related jobs uh, going and then as Ian was saying as well also looking ahead to looking at what are some of the challenges they're making um, investment in these kind of big public infrastructure projects more attractive for those broader capital markets because that then feeds back and has a benefit more widely across government and across uh, the public sector and um, really you know just the scale of the um, numbers that you have there in terms of loan authority uh, really quite impressive.
Impressive, uh, also daunting, Siobhan. <laughs> yeah, you have to spend all of that. Absolutely, yeah, definitely. Thanks, Chris. Thank you so much. Um, Michael, I'm coming over to you. Yeah, thanks, Siobhan. Uh, and great to be here today um, and uh, speak. Uh, and, and it was really interesting listening to the last two speakers. I mean, it, it really covers the point of where public sector has to play in this overall delivery of infrastructure. I mean, uh, if you look at the, the numbers and, you know, five trillion a year, for the next however many years to, to fill in, you know, OECD talks about 6.8 trillion a year to meet our, our uh, sustainability targets. You know, that's, they're all huge numbers, but the reality and, and even worse post COVID is at best public sector can support fit about 50% of that funding. So that means to make any, to, to make this work, um, you need to leverage the, the public sector money where, where it is best used. Um, but you need to bring in pri um, private capital here. Um, and, and that's where you then suddenly have, you know, funding and financing costs and the borrowing costs and what that impact is on projects and, and what does that do as you progress through this. But I, I guess if you step back, there, there is this continued drive for investment. So, you know, post COVID, there's all the stimulus packages, getting the economies moving again. But in many ways, in the infrastructure side and, and, and on the energy side, that was a driver because there, there was a gap in anyway. There was a short a shortfall on, on previous investment. Um, but you know what we would have seen um, all the way through COVID is, is that the focus on climate sustainability and any quality became you know really stayed stayed really high on the agenda, and so all governments have have, have shifted properly to that and, and and in terms of of the the approach to investment and and uh, putting aligning their infrastructure plans with that. You then have <clears throat> events in in Ukraine and and uh, in different parts of the world. That whole energy crisis piece is driving self-sustainability and, and dri driving that that uh, energy piece so uh, and, and how do you solve that at a country level so there's there's loads of drivers to do this of course there's increasing challenges you know you've got your costs are increasing your you have from you know challenges around supply chain which is impacting just costs generally but but inflation on top of that you've got um general constraints in terms of the, the market the other bits that are causing, you know, from a finance point of view, is is now these these finance requirements. And um, while you know, in certain jurisdictions, that's increasing your cost of build. You make your you make it back in the in the future, but your 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 initial investment cost actually you know can be higher in certain cases. Um, and then you're starting layering in um, certain technologies. And 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 I I think you know the point previously, it, it's not not all of these are new and and, and cutting edge. But in some cases, they are new for finance houses, and and uh, and, and to get that that risk, and, and and also you've got different players who are now playing in a in a public sector uh, environment, and 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 the scale that that brings um, to and and and, and you know, see different players and how they how they manage their scale and their ability to to risk. Um, so you know all of those uh, are aligned with you know increasing that that uh, your borrowing costs, which is sort of the <laughs> you know is only one of the line items here, um, and you also then have capacity of the of governments to borrow post COVID. So so lots lots of moving parts, um, and so so how do you drive that forward? And and um, I mean it, you know the easiest thing for government is to not do anything here because they they they, they save their money. Um, and you know they, they just basically you know, support on a social welfare point of view. Thankfully, I mean we're we are seeing. I mean we heard the US and UK and others are taking a more positive approach to this. Um, but we got to make sure that, you know that that doesn't you don't run out of money and don't, that cost doesn't become the barrier here. Um, and so when you know government does is very good at doing cost benefit analysis, it comes down in, into the value for money, all of those sort of things which is all fair and valid um however what doesn't always get captured is particularly as you're talking about climate and, and is the, the future benefit um and equality and, and, and what does that do and, and, and leveling up in the uk how do you how do you layer in the value of that into your assessment and make sure that it's properly captured and, and gets an, a, an appropriate weighting versus the cost of of, a, of the project um and so, so as you 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 drive this forward, I mean the the you know how do how do you get projects done in a difficult time? Well, you've got to have proper structuring. You've got to make sure you've got proper prioritization. 
um, looking at that, you know, qualitative benefits as well as everything else, and and, and not just to get it through, um, but also then the, the the management of costs and looking at how how you do that, that you don't layer on way too much risk just for the, the, the because you don't want to you, you think that's the way you should do it from a public point of view so a far more sensible view and i think you know using people like the infrastructure bank in the uk that experience of, of structuring the deals to get and, and layering in public money to, to you know and in areas where there where there might be perceived higher risk and managing that i think is, is uh is important and the last bit on, on that cba bit is, is remember if, if this if you don't have this activity and, and you were using infrastructure as an investment um, and, and subsequently sustainability investment to, to create stimulus post COVID, if you suddenly then say, well, borrowing costs are too high, we're not, we're going to do less. You, 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 you slow that down and you create, you, you, you're now going back to creating the impact of a slower economy. Um, and, and there is talks of recessions in, in various parts of the world. You, that has a cost in itself in terms of the support government is there. so so a positive spend rather than than having to support um post uh you know impact is is uh, is is something to be considered so in terms of, of what needs to be done uh, you know you know I, I, when we're looking at these projects um f focusing on what the value creation is where you can leverage in uh, government to look at the, the you know, try to avoid 100% funding, um, but but layering in that you can bring in and it's properly structured, you can bring in private finance as much as possible. Um, and ideally having a bias towards bringing in private finance here. So that private sector participation, um, and, and, and I use that carefully because in, in many countries, we talk about P3s and PPPs and, and uh, what we found is is that um, people automatically jump to a particular structure and a particular deal type, <clears throat> which isn't as flexible as you might want. And and the more we get into technology, you know, sort of these energy based and and, and uh, sustainable type of transactions, you need more flexibility. And so we we're the way we we approach it is is we try and look at the the business case and all the moving parts on it. We try and see where we're creating value, and then we see how how you bring private finance into that. And it's only after you've done that that you figure out how you procure it. And it might be a P three, but it's more likely to be something a, a, a some hybrid of that. But if you have that bias towards pushing this in, you, you can um, uh, you, you can make space for private finance, reduce their risk that you're managing the cost of that finance, and um, but also bringing the best of them in, in order to do that. Um, and that proper structuring helps you then to um, look at, at uh, you know, the, 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 the costing of this, looking at the potential to refinance in the future when, when, when cost of debt reduces or, or you, you can change the risk profile. The other thing, and it was mentioned in terms of, of the economic side, is, you, you know, there will be more inter-country inter, uh, uh, trade. I mean, that, that, that step, but on an infrastructure point of view, Again, as you're trying to do as much as possible locally, stimulate the economy locally, that, that's fine. And, and you can do that with a labor. But, but because of the expertise that you're going to need, there will be imports around uh, um, certain elements here. I think the use of, of export credit type finance is another way of, of uh, and another layer of finance that you can start bringing in. Um, and, uh, you know, many countries are doing this, but it, it, it sort of helps the local economy from a government point of view. In terms of the the export export, but also helps the financing on the other end in terms of of, of bringing in that private capital, um, which is probably easier to get in because it's coming with with the the, the operation side. So, um, you know, we've been looking at this private equity piece and uh, for some time in, in in terms of how how that can layer in, and we see there's an appetite, but it's that translation between private capital. Um, and and uh, public sector, making sure you don't make you're putting up unnecessary barriers in place, uh, and, and and allowing this 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 activity. I think making sure that we don't put in you know don't slow things down because we're seeing increased costs, but we put in the care and and, and different measures, but understanding what we're trying to achieve in the long term, um, and that's how you know that consistency of pipeline consistency of, 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 of interaction between public and private sector is how we address uh, the challenges that are going forward. You know, big challenges, 
but if we get it right, we have a better world and, and, and uh, you know, better society from, from uh, and, and infrastructure is the driver on that. Thanks so much, Michael. I mean, really um, setting that big picture, I think what you said, lots of people will be, uh, will resonate with that even during COVID, um, there was that, that focus on equality and climate stayed really high and we haven't lost that. Uh, for the officials and the civil servants in the audience, very much that reminder of, um, you know, the cost benefits have to stack up. So uh, they have to be doing that um, uh, due diligence on the kind of cost benefits of this. But equally, what you said there is be flexible on the models then. Like you have to look at different ways of layering in that private finance and really understanding where private finance adds value to all of that. And then finally, what you said there about trying to remove as many of those barriers to partnerships as possible, while at the same time in the public sector, making sure you keep the measures in place that mean you can manage that uh, project robustly. Thanks so much, Michael, for giving us. I'm sure we'll come back to some kind of specific examples maybe that you've been uh, working on as well uh, with partners around the world. And then um, before we go to our final speaker, just a reminder to the audience, do uh, get your questions coming in because in a short while, we'll be handing over to you guys for your questions. Alexandra, over to you. Thank you, Shohan. Thank you for the opportunity to bring a uh, brilliant perspective of infrastructure. Um, beyond the, the, the points that were already mentioned by, by um, my colleague here, uh, of course, uh, emerging countries has still more, even more challenges to find infrastructure. And Brazil currently has one of the largest PPP infrastructure pipelines in the world. Uh, give the numbers over the last four years, over 200 billion US dollars uh, private investments were contracted in PPPs. And my goal here at administration infrastructure is to find solutions to fund all those projects. So um, yeah, so funding infrastructure is one of the greatest challenges we are currently facing here, especially in this post-COVID scenario where government has raised their the debt, the debt and with this fiscal constraints, it's definitely a must to attract even more private investments to infrastructure. Uh, we estimate here that our gap in infrastructure investments is around 2% of our GDP. So, but for my, my opening comments, um, I will highlight a successful policy we have here in Brazil to attract private investments to infrastructure and also talk about next steps that we are planning for this policy. So 10 years ago, Brazil has created um, the incentivized infrastructure bonds. They are securities whose interest and capital gains uh, enjoy income tax exemption. Of course, if the, they use those funds to finance infrastructure. So I, I bring here the a chart, if you can see in the chart, this is the growth of um, emissions of those bonds. You can see that they have skyrocketed, uh, skyrocketed over the last couple of years. Of course, you cannot consider here uh, 2020 because of the pandemic that affected the whole economy. But we were like five years ago, we had something like 1 billion US dollars in emissions per year. Now we have almost 10 billion US per year. And next slide, please. And in this next slide, you can see that uh, there was a change in terms of public investments by the, uh, the Brazilian uh, Development Bank uh, in comparison with this uh, capital market solution, the, the centralized infrastructure bonds. So it was, but there was a shift in terms of what the, the development bank, uh, what was the participation of the development bank in terms of uh, direct investments in infrastructure. I, I, I think this, this, this chart is by 2016, but if you if I went uh, uh, back to then, there was more than 10 billion US dollars for per year from the development bank, and now it's a budget shift for for this this uh, infrastructure bonds. And the the, the, the development bank now is 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 focusing on, on structuring projects for PPPs, especially because of this the future constraints that we have directly in Brazil. Um, in terms of next steps, uh, I think that the, 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 the policy was 
was successful, but in terms of next steps, the, I think the, the, the policy was focusing on individual investors. And that that is a problem because, I mean, pension funds, they, they don't have the benefit. And they are the natural, I mean, they, they have the natural suitability to invest in infrastructure, right? Because of the, if you match the, the assets and, and, the, and the liabilities. So uh, we are focusing now in attracting uh, those, those institutional investors, such as pension funds, expanding this, this benefits, this tax assumption to the, also to institutional investors. And additionally, we are focusing on attracting international investors for those bonds. And this bond, those bonds are currently assets that, um, that they, are, they have to be dominated in Brazilian reais and traded in local market uh, under Brazilian jurisdiction. But in order to attract the international investors, there is a bill that we have proposed and it was already approved in the first house of Congress in Brazil to allow those bonds to be denominated in a foreign currency. And also they could be traded in a foreign jurisdiction with the same benefit as they have here in Brazil. So yeah, the focus is to, to bring this international investors. And yes, to finish my opening comments, um, uh, I'll highlight another challenge we have in Brazil that we still have a lot of uh, corporate finance in our, in our finance and infrastructure. It's a problem because in general, the, the banks, they, 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 they demand a corporate guarantee for the companies and that, that's really a problem. And you really uh, researching and analyzing, uh, uh, trying to, to, we are in research with multilaterals and other organizations to help to address this bottleneck on how to make projects more uh, better to attract, you know, pure project finance structures. I know, you know that, that there is some some challenges here because of the interest rates that are um, high, the sharing of risks, and also the foreign exchange. That it's also a problem for Brazil. But yes, we are, we are trying to make the projects more, to make it better to in order to so they can can you can have a project finance structure for those projects. Yeah, I think I think that's that's it from my from my opening comments. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alexandra. So really interesting to get the perspective from Brazil. We've obviously got some slightly different challenges. I think maybe some additional uh, challenges um, with your economic situation there, but interesting to hear the, um, as you say, the skyrocketing there of the incentivized uh, bonds going from kind of 1 billion a year up to $10 uh, billion um, per year. The scale of the uh, funding gap that you need to um, bridge uh, getting private investment, so 2% of the GDP, you were saying, as your estimate, um, and then how much you've shifted from kind of relying on funding from the development bank to that shift to uh, funding from the capital markets and more use of kind of PPPs as well. And then finally, what you say, looking to the future, to hoping to expand uh, more to kind of institution investors, not just relying on individual investors, and um, looking at international investors as well, uh, which requires that kind of shift in legislation. So thank you so much, Alexandra, for that. Um, we are now going to uh, come to a little bit of um, discussion and then some questions as well. And I guess for me, uh, the first question that I want to ask is, um, and all of you mentioned this shift um, to a kind of greener type of project, uh, you know, especially building back better after the pandemic. So can you just give me a little bit more flavor of the kind of the changing nature of infrastructure projects? So what are the types of projects that are gonna require investment and how has that changed compared to um, previous years? I'm going to change the order a little bit. So Chris, I'll come to you first on this one. Yeah, so I mean, maybe I'll give an example of some of the projects that have become public uh, from our office that I think will help uh, answer uh, your question, Siobhan, and then and then catalyze the the direction of the conversation. So we had two projects that became public through our advanced transportation vehicle manufacturing program. The first was a electric vehicle battery anode facility um, in Louisiana, where it takes spherical graphite from uh, another country and it. Uh, processes that into uh, battery anodes and then sells those battery anodes to, you know, uh, electric vehicle manufacturing companies. So um, that was definitely a supply chain project. 
the idea that you know we needed to catalyze the manufacturing of electric vehicle batteries and the and the supply of the parts for those batteries here in the US, right? So so that was a sort of lean into that project, lean into that archetype because we know that we're going to need to be more thoughtful about supply chains, you know, sort of post COVID. Um, the other big project in that program was a joint venture between General Motors and um, LG, where we provided uh, the senior debt on a uh, 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 sort of joint venture company that was going to uh, build three EV battery assembly facilities in the United States. Um, and if we're going to see significant penetration in the vehicle sales market of electric vehicles, we do not have remotely the scale of the manufacturing of either the EVs themselves or the batteries. And so we're gonna to need to see a uh, investment in that part of the economy. And that was the program that 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 we provided debt to uh, of, or committed to provide debt to a few months ago. Right. Um, so I think you're gonna see that kind of uh, uh, sort of, I don't know if that's vertical integration or, 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 or supply chain views mm -hmm. of, of a particular, um, item or a particular component of, of, uh, of manufacturing. On the other side, um, we announced a uh, large scale hydrogen energy storage uh, project in Utah, where we are where we took, um, well, the, 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 the project took excess renewable energy from California. Think of it as solar power during the summer daytime when they don't need as much uh, of the power as it is as, as they were generating. And in fact, the marginal price of electricity at the Cal ISO sometimes dipped below, below zero. So you can utilize that excess um, renewable power. Power electrolyzers create hydrogen and then store that hydrogen in salt caverns in Utah, which again, uh, old fixed income mortgage nerd, I don't know enough about the chemistry, but apparently they, those caverns are very good at storing yeah. Uh, gases and hydrogen is a is a particularly tough gas to store. So this worked really well. And then you could pump out that hydrogen in the wintertime and use it in a combined cycle gas turbine, create electricity and send back to California. In a sense, seasonally load shifting mm -hmm. renewable energy. Right. So cool. And these are the kinds of projects that, but for large scale lending, I don't think get done. And so as we are looking at our pipeline, and, and for those interested, on our website, we show our, our pipeline of projects by technology on a monthly basis. Um, you can see the kinds of technologies that we're trying to lean into and, uh, and help catalyze. So I don't know if that is exactly yeah, the, right. the, the path for the question, but as we think about the, the sort of archetype of industrial policy or the archetype of technology that we want to we wanna try to catalyze, that's, you know, I, I think those anecdotal examples yeah. can help you extrapolate correctly to the kind of projects that we're looking to. Uh, and they're really good forward. examples because you can see why these are such innovative kind of projects. You can see why maybe there's a caution on behalf of some potential investors in getting involved in these. Michael, you work with lots of different departments around the world. Uh, are Chris's examples the types of things that you're seeing now in terms of different kinds of projects going forward? Uh, yeah, yes, I, I'm like every country is, is specific, but but um, I mean, I, I think the interesting bit is is you're, you're, you, that what Chris is looking at doing is is not only solving what we're looking at that energy and, and sustainability piece, but you're also creating an economic activity within the within the local uh, in, in, you know geography and and um, and that that sort of helps pay for it and, and you know creates jobs and do, does all of that thing so so it actually helps on the equality piece as well and, and and layers those things in um and i think it's that sort of you know you know layering through and and, and that thread through through projects is, is is becoming far more important and becoming more apparent the other bits we're seeing is that um you know governments are are very focused on on what needs to be in place so so to go on on where chris is going on the batteries well, you need chargers, you need a proper transmission system, you need, you know, I'm making sure all that works, but you also need to make sure that it that it's okay for today and, and you've got a certain amount of, of, of um, demand on it, but where where it's going to. And, and, and so this whole charger network, 
that is consistent where you can be used by by all vehicles um and and then where is it going to go and uh, as you get greater range in, in in these type of vehicles going forward um but but make you know layering those in that becoming a, a sort of you know one of these these things that that uh, governments are challenged with because and 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 you know one of the difficulties they're having is because it's in multiple departments who have the national grid or the you know the, the you know department of energy manages the, the the grid and then you've got other party you know private sector and commercial sector manages the the uh the charging stations um or could or should the, you know what happens if the public sector gets involved what what's the revenue risk how does that all, all get get there so so the challenges the other bits that we're seeing is um and again, it, it's what does government do is, is around um, buildings. And, and um, so, again, it, it, you know, there there's lots of things you see in New York where they're they're putting, you know, penalties on on on, uh, you know, all building owners if, if there's not if it's not made sustainable over a period of time. Yeah. Um, and, you know, what the, the challenges we're seeing is, is that people don't know how to do these things. So it's not it's not that they don't want to. Um, it's that there isn't the the economy in place, like like Chris talked about in terms of those base, uh, you know, suppliers who, who are you know helping. How do I how do I transition from one to another? But also then the scale of investment. It's 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 sort of micro investment in, in the little projects, but could be significant. And and so from a government point of view, how do I how do I do this at a at a building level and it's and it's micro that doesn't quite fit in. I'm not even quite sure where it sits. Does it count as infrastructure, even though it probably is. Yeah. But the, but there's that piece on 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 layering in the two, and in, in terms of having enough capacity within the marketplace to to green the city or the you know or or, or smaller parts of it, um, and doing those, but, but working all the way through. So it, it is a challenge. Private sector is getting more is 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 very keen to get involved because uh, you know it's been putting money into into energy projects for years. Yeah. Um. But there but there's different. But they need to understand public sector, and, and they're they're the challenges. Thanks, Michael. Um, I'm going to come back to that issue of um, sometimes people don't even know how to do this because it's so new and so many different yeah. things. Back to that um, in a minute. Alexandra, the types, what are the types of infrastructure projects that you're prioritizing in Brazil at the moment? Uh, so uh, I'd like to highlight the change that we are facing now in terms of the uh, transport matrix. Uh, we have most of the cargo currently still transported by, by roads. And now we are changing for railways mm -hmm. and that's of course it's good for for environment and also we made a, a, a policy that these new ppp railways are going to auction already being certified already a certificate for green green bond emissions so that that that's important because we can access uh, uh, investors with uh, a mandate for for this kind of of assets, and, and so it's, it's something that is important for us right now to change this, this 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 transport matrix. And I would also um, mention the social aspect of that in terms of for the, our sanitation sector. Um, we, we recently had the new sanitation legal framework, who allows private investments for 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 this sector. In the past, it was uh, totally uh, invested by the government. Now we have a new framework for that, and also the 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 bonds I mentioned earlier. They could they could be used for this for this for the sanitation sector. So we, 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 I believe sanitation sector is one of the, the biggest priorities for us. It's a bottleneck for Brazil. So to yeah. give you a number, over fifty percent of our house doesn't does not have a sewage system it's crazy but it's true yeah so uh so you think that i think that's uh that's we have this environmental uh aspect and also the social aspect in terms especially in sanitation thanks it would be really interesting to see whether because you're still doing some of those big fundamental projects whether you can at the same time build in all the sustainability so you don't then have to go back and retrofit like we're having to do in some other countries as well so it'd be interesting to see how that goes Ian, um, are these the kind of projects uh, that you already have or are looking to be um, kind of helping to attract investment in these kind of greener? Broad, broadly, um, I'll give a slightly different take in a second. I mean, 
going back to your original question, what's different? I think tech, technology risk is definitely the biggest difference. You know, and people are still building roads, they still build hospitals and schools. Um, but you know, how often do you build a hydrogen manufacturing plant and link it to a CCUS cluster? Um, yeah, not very often. Uh, certainly uh, not, not on this side of the world. Um, so technology is very different. The, the other thing that we worry about, um, which we might not have worried about a few years ago, is, is place. You know, where, where is this happening? So go back to what I was saying earlier on about our levelling up agenda. Uh, you know, when we're considering an investment, we we think a lot about where is it happening. Um, as, as certainly those in the UK will know, you know, we have no issue with investment in the bottom right-hand corner of the country. Um, but as you go further away from there, um, you know, there is definitely uh, some, some quite visible inequalities. And so we, I don't know if I'd go as far as saying it's a bias, but we definitely want to try to make things happen elsewhere in the country. Um, an example that might be, and it's publicly, it's on, it's on our website, you know, a, a little while ago this year, we um, <clears throat> helped the financing for broadband rollout um, in, in Northern Ireland. Um, now, there's plenty of money available for broadband rollout generally in, in this country, but when you start to get to areas where um, it's harder to reach and where therefore it's more expensive to yeah. be doing rollout, um, suddenly um, you know, financing interest wanes. Um, and that was an area where we were able to, to, to get involved. Um, a, a, a similar example, um, again, in the digital space, but we were able to structure a transaction where our money was used specifically for the hardest areas. Yeah. I won't say the other banks didn't care, but they were more looking at the corporate covenant, whereas we were much more interested in well, how is our money being used and how is it going to further our aim yeah. of looking up. So we, we, we think about things a little bit differently. And I guess that's going back to Michael's point, whereas deciding where best to use the limited public resources that you have uh, in these projects as well. Thanks. We've had a question come in from Ike, who's from Kenya, but currently in China. Um, and Ike's question is, how can we address the challenge of the lack of data to support risk assessment that is an important part of infrastructure development? I want to expand that question a little bit and add to it as well. Do you think more broadly that kind of civil servants have the necessary skills to be kind of looking afresh at some of these new ways of funding uh, major projects? So one, do they have the data available to do this? But also, do they have the skills now that we're looking at different ways of funding? Do you think the civil service has the skills and the capacity, and as Ike says, the data available uh, to be able to uh, kind of manage some of these uh, projects? Um, Michael, I'm going to start with you, because obviously this is maybe an area where you help to plug some of those uh, kind of gaps. Yeah, I, look, I mean, the data, data piece is... is uh is a challenge i mean because and, and you can so you can always have more and and but i think what's happening more more and more is 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 that there are uh, you know organizations and and, and government is, is gathering it uh and using it in a in a, in a you know I, I guess a more coordinated fashion um but could it be better absolutely is it changing every day because of you know all the factors that that are are you know the moving parts and, and as you go into new technology and all of that that you know it becomes a, a greater challenge to stay on top of it. Um, and that's where, you know, having, you know, very good public sector is, is, is vital here to, in order to, to deliver. Um, and, you know, what I'd say, it's, it's not a capability issue in many cases, although there are some times where, you know, experience of bringing in private finance, you know, doesn't necessarily, or, or you know, or, or automatically come within a government role. Um, but we have very bright people there and, 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 and will understand the principle. Sometimes it is, it is that the, the policy, it is the approach to involving private finance. And, and as I said earlier, you, you know, using a bias to say, look, we, we're, we're going to need to work together with yeah. new partners. Um, and if you see, you know, through COVID, we were, you know, public sector all around the world showed they can do this. Absolutely. They can, you know, bring in new partners doing different things work rapidly and and uh, and and everybody you know d delivers on on what's required so so bringing that same approach into a a, a um, an infrastructure delivery point of view um gathering the data and and it's never going to be a, a, you know perfect but using that and then that experience and know-how wrapped around it using the the different partners and and 
you know, you know, externals to provide that fill those gaps and, and, and having entities like, you know, UK infrastructure bank and all, you know, that's real skills that fall in, you know, put, put the, you, you start bringing the best of, of, of all the elements together to get a proper transaction. Um, but ultimately, if, if, if the civil service bosses say, look, we're, 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 we're going to try and do this with as much as we can out of our own pocket, um, you're never going to, you know, that, that means you're cutting off half the market that you yeah. still need. Um, and so it's, it's that positive bias towards still doing all the right things, all the things that public sector should do, but, but trying to get, find partnerships here in, in this new market that's, that is going to be different, you know, but, but, but they'll, they'll get there quite rapidly, I believe. Thanks, Michael. Ian, I'm going to ask you the same question. So the question of data, uh, to what extent is that an issue, but also just capacity within the civil service to do this. And obviously, I guess the, the, the creation of the bank itself shows that we're trying to put expertise into the system. Well, I, I, th I think our creation is one of the best ways of answering the question. Um, and, you know, I, I would say this, wouldn't I, because a lot of the civil servants are our colleagues. But um, from what I've seen, I, I think there's the, you know, if the place is full of very intelligent people um, who, importantly, if they don't know the answer themselves, will go and find the answer. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think our teams of people are constantly out talking to the market, or if they're not talking to the market directly, um, they're asking people like us. Mm. And there are other arms of government like us to inform them about what's going on in the market. So that doesn't worry me so much. I mean, capacity, yes, I mean, there's a lot going on in the world right now. So, um, and everyone appears to be incredibly busy. So mm. are there enough of us and is everybody focused on the right thing? That's a separate question. Mm. But I, I think one thing about data, it, it, it's all very well to have data, but is it comparable to your other data? And, and that's really, really important because if I go and talk to five or six different projects and say, can you give me data on the seven following criteria? I'm sure, they'll all give me the data, but is it actually comparable across those projects? And then if I go and share that with, with Chris or with Alexandra, is, is that data then comparable with um, <clears throat> the, the same, same data with the same name? But is it is it being gathered in the same way? Is it measuring exactly the same thing? So yeah. it's a, it's a real issue with data. We can you can almost end up with too much of it. So so the easy answer is yes, of course we need more data. Um, but it's really important as we gather it to try and this needs an awful lot of cooperation. But to try to make sure it's comparable with other people's data, yeah. so it's actually useful. Otherwise, just just gathering a whole pile of data in isolation isn't isn't actually particularly important. Yeah, thanks, Ian. Alexandra, do you agree with that the quality of data is just as important, obviously more important than the quantity, but also the kind of ability of civil servants to be uh, kind of moving into this new world? Yeah, absolutely. I think I think uh, the quality is, is, is the most important thing, and I think I think in, ge in general uh, our ministerial body is qualified, but. Uh, you know, the, the market changes every day. So we need updates on the best practice around the world. And that's definitely uh, a problem for us. We, we try to make, to, to address that with cooperation, with multilateral bodies. Mm -hmm. And this is always welcome for us. Uh, so we, we have some initiatives with the World Bank, with IDB, that help us a lot with how to, to us, uh, to bring us data and also to 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 to, to read that to to qualify, make a, the 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 right analysis of this this data, and but yes, we, we welcome all this high quality trainees or an advisor service that to to help our country and and that, that, that's that's really important for us. Yeah, thanks, Sajan. That exchange of expertise and ideas across civil services really really helpful. Chris, your thoughts on this data question and civil servants. Yeah, I mean, on the data question, I actually think that's part of the raison d'etre of, of programs like ours, right, is that if if all of the data was there, why wouldn't JP Morgan just finance the, the widget factory, right? So um, in a very real way, like, you know, we're, we're supposed to be there to lean into those kinds of projects to leverage the fact that in the United States, the Department of Energy has the National Lab uh, system with 10, 10 15,000 scientists who can help us make a good guess as to whether or not the commercial scaling up of making widgets is possible and what the risks are going to be and we'll get it right we'll get it wrong but like we're 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 supposed to be there to provide that lending such that we can then publish that data such that then jp morgan can make that loan later on um 
the civil servant question, I, you know, if, if I can, if I can um, uh, uh, stand on my soapbox and wax philosophically for, for less than a minute, like I've been blown away working in government as to how dedicated and how good the people are. I spent, you know, 21 years in the private sector and I've only been spending a year, uh, a little more than a year here in government. And it's been really refreshing. It's been really um, uh, heartwarming. And I don't want to make it sound like I'm auditioning for a Frank, Frank Capra movie, but like, it's really good. And you, I, I, I have had the opportunity to meet with colleagues uh, in energy uh, organizations across the globe, and I feel the same way about them. And so that part is actually really good. Um, so I think we have, we have the, we have the uh, mandate from the legislatures. We have the 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 corporate culture or whatever the word is in government. And we are staffing up. We need to hire more people. I would imagine that other places around the world are in the same uh, the same position in order for us to achieve the mandates that we have been given. But like, I feel very excited with, uh, with the momentum, the direction. And, um, and so I, I, I actually am, uh, I'm particularly excited and bold up right now on the opportunity set and our ability to execute on that set. Thanks, Chris. I think our audience will really like what you said there about the kind of talent that you found and the passion that you found uh, in the in the public sector. OK, we've got a question that came in in advance and, and it picks up on kind of I think what all of you have talked about in terms of um, how does the public sector um, incentivize kind of private finance? So I just wonder if you could unpick a little bit more for me. What are the actual ways in which uh, public sector organisations can make these uh, projects more attractive for uh, private financing. So what are the actual things that they can do uh, to help that? Um, Alexandra, I'm going to come to you first on this one. Yeah, I think I mentioned some of the, the, those, the, those points before. I, I think the I mean, tax incentives, I think it's something that that the government can do I mean, to make sure that the investments goes to where the government wants to, where the government wants to. Um, and also um, make, I mean, the most important thing I think is to, it's to structure good projects, right? If, if the project is well structured, I think the private investments will, will, will move us in this project. Uh, so I, I would say that, uh, the, the government can give incentives like I mentioned, like and, and, uh, the, the, the bond I mentioned before, and also the government can um, can also help in terms of this uh, environmental aspects in terms of uh, uh, as I mentioned, try to to make projects that already have some uh, some so social stamp or environmental stamp. That, that it, and so I think this this creates a value for the private uh, company that is looking for this project. That yeah. it's easier to finance this kind of this kind of project. Thanks, Alexandra. So some kind of tax incentives, but also just really highlighting the kind of social uh, benefits of these projects, which some you know private sector companies care about uh, uh, increasingly now. Um, Ian, I'm coming to you on this question, and I want to add in Elena. Um, has asked, uh, coming back to your remark about the need for bias towards private finance, how do we achieve that? So I think it's a similar question, a different way of uh, phrasing the question. So she's saying, who are the key decision makers that can make that happen? And she's not convinced that at a working level, um, it will generate the change that's needed. Um, I think... <laughs> um, this maybe is addressing the very last point about, about at what level is it decided that this there's a couple of things government can do directly. And I think there are some things that, that organizations like mine or, or, or Chris can do structurally. Um, but if, if I go back to my days as a, as a, as a lender um, in the private sector, what was the thing I wanted most? Uh, and the answer is probably certainty, um, particularly for some of these nascent technologies. Um, so I mean, two areas I'd pick on is, is do we have a clear regulatory framework? Uh, people know what they're signing up to not today or tomorrow or next year but for the next 10 years you know um, yeah. these financings are 10 15 20 30 year financings so you've got to have some idea of what you're what you're signing up to and, and really only government can do that yeah um 
perhaps slightly shorter term, but linked to that is, is again, with these uh, very new technologies, do we have some sort of price certainty? You know, there is only so much merchant risk the market will take, and, and, and the more merchant risk we're taking for the younger the project, younger the technology, the yeah. more likelihood it is that we're going to have to get involved because the market will be afraid to go back to the data point. They don't have any data. They don't have any track record. They don't know yeah. what the thing's going to look like. So I, I think certainty coming from government is an enormous help. And then um, from people like us, it's structuring. I mentioned earlier on, you know, do we put a piece of mez in um, so that we can make um, the senior lenders feel more comfortable and, and therefore yeah. proud of the capital? Do we do some equity to endorse uh, our comfort uh, with the technology and then let somebody else lend? So there's, there's a number of different ways of, of approaching this, I think. Thanks, Ian. Chris, did you want to add anything there in terms of... Uh... Look, the, the one thing I'd think about is, is that there are, there are the there are the broad paintbrush things that we can do, right? Tax incentives and cheap debt increase the return of equity uh, for, for projects, right? So we can do that. We have that knob, right? Um, and that's really what the Loan Programs Office at DOE and the and obviously what Congress view and via uh, the Department of the Treasury uh, through the tax incentives and the implementation of that, that's what they can do. On the earlier stage projects, right, we, uh, our Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations has a lot more flexibility to try to figure out what the constraint is. I used the term de-risk earlier. What's that? What is the what is the thing that's mm. that's preventing or what do we think will prevent capital formation in the future? And 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 we can try to be maybe a little bit more targeted about that. And so I think when when you get to later stage commercial deployment, um, you know, it it's a lot easier for us to see, all right, well, you know, we're we're adding we're adding fuel, we're adding leverage, yeah. we're adding accelerant, right? On the earlier stages, we, we, we may need to be more targeted um, in terms of how we are thinking about sort of unlocking the future capital deployment. And, um, you know, that's how we are, that's how we're, there with, with, we're sort of thinking about that. Thanks, Chris. Michael, did you have anything to add on this? How do you actually make them you know, attractive to private finance? I mean, it's you've got to understand what the roles of everybody is. So, so private finance is it wants its money back and wants to make a return. It's 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 very simple and very clear, you know. And 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 uh, it's it's what's the risks and certainties around that, and 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 the understanding of what of of those elements, and that's where the data piece is. Um, now, and so you want need to understand what the roles of everybody is. If you're bringing private sector in to bring capability into that as well, that's a different matter again. And so, so understanding the roles and responsibilities, a lot understanding the risks and, and a fair view of what the risks are of each of those parties, and particularly with those that we're trying to attract in. And then, you know, is it that they they do need, you know, from a if it's a commercial sector and, and, and it's, you know as a thing to investment. Is it the tax breaks that they're looking for or are those grants to help them do their r d or whatever it is but from the finance point of view is there a level of risk and you, you know that that uh, the the merchant risk as as, as you call you know that, that that you know the revenue stream where how risky is that yeah. or, or not who's paying it if it's for coming from government well it's less risky well then that's okay there's a there's a certainty that they will pay if it's coming from the market you don't know whether this product will sell and therefore greater risk and you, come, you then you start layering in amounts. Uh, that's where public funding, you know, the leveraging of public funding can come in in terms of of dealing with those specific risks. Yeah. But it comes back to that capability, and uh, as well is you need to understand the breakdown of of a of a deal of a, of of the you know what you're putting together and into the, and understand those risks in order to be able to to break it down so you can actually intervene where it's useful. And get out of the way when it's not, um, and that's that's how how you and I'm putting even the understanding of and both of those actions are are important when you're trying to get the private sector involved because they want to do stuff, they, so they they will see public sector as, as potentially slower and and whether I should get involved or not, but they also if they see those deals they understand them and they get they can get this support on the investment piece. Well, then it's the best of both worlds. So, so it's helping those two. A, a lot of engagement with with the, with the investment community, I think, is is important at the very start as you try and do that, um, and explaining this, but but showing that knowledge of we understand how it works, we understand what your 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 objectives are, 
and we're we're addressing this not to give you everything you want because it's a deal but um yeah. you know certainly something that is workable within your constraints and and ours thanks michael i can't believe how quickly the time has gone we've got one last question coming in but we'll have to keep the answers quite uh brief on these uh, on this question but so um ike has come back and said how can we address the issue of regional differences in infrastructure flows in African countries. And again, I just want to broaden that a little bit. We've heard quite a lot about kind of greener projects, projects that have the environment at the heart of it, but both Ian and Chris mentioned their objectives as well. They also had kind of equality objectives, whether that was local and regional growth leveling up, or Chris, you mentioned kind of investment in uh, kind of communities that hadn't been invested in historically in the past. So building on Ike's question, my question is, how successful do you think governments are currently being in attracting alternative kind of funding sources for infrastructure projects that have an equality um, kind of objective around them? Um, Chris, I'm gonna start with you first on this one. The real answer, Siobhan, is I don't know yet. Uh, we're working on it. We're working on developing uh, our definitions. We're working on developing our maps. Um, it is a it is a strong objective of our administration to uh, to to invest in communities that have been underinvested in. Um, but I, I guess in terms of the, the 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 more complete answer, it's not just investments; it's community engagement, right? So you know, our office and 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 in fact, the Department of Energy as a whole have invested you know person power as well as time and energy in making the interactions with our local communities in, in across the United States um, uh, effective, listening, uh, uh, creating offices such that local and state governments can contact us, uh, understanding what their needs are, how their processes work. You know, um, I, I, unfortunately, I don't know if this goes to the question, but like, you know, a lot of a lot of people will say things like the problem with energy infrastructure investment in the United States is the uh, uh, licensing and permitting process is a disaster. OK, but in order for it to be uh, less uh, onerous, right, it's incumbent upon all of us to engage in the dialogue with stakeholders who make those uh, decisions yeah. in a way that they understand what our objectives are, what our uh, applicants' objectives are, and we understand what the local community's objectives are, and that we work together to cause the most optimal transaction to be done in the most optimal time period possible. Yeah. And that interaction, I think, is key. Thanks, Chris. So really important to build all those uh, foundational conditions as well. Alexandra, within your kind of overall infrastructure strategy, do you have a regional uh, kind of plan as well? Yeah, we have a regional plan. And uh, have, I think there are two ways to, to deal with that. Uh, that there is a way that we, we bundle uh, good projects with projects that are not viable. So we bundle them together. Okay. For example, I'll give you the airport sector where the, the ones who won the airport of Sao Paulo got, got airports from Northeast and North of Brazil. So that's a way to stimulate the regions. Yeah. Uh, so that, that has been successful in the airport sector. And I, I think there's other countries that had some success in terms of uh, asset recycling programs as well. So you get the revenues from, uh, for example, for a, for a PPP that is viable and you yeah. get this money to, for example, fund that this fund invests in regional uh, areas that the government uh, wants to foster. So yeah. I think that's the uh, some of the ways that we can deal with this regional difference yeah, thanks, Anjan. And that might be relevant for Ike's question about the kind of African uh, situation as well. Michael, did you want to say anything about kind of regional um, investment or, or equality in general? No, look, I, I think the fact that equality is is actually part of the assessment now for infrastructure investment and and, and wider government piece. I mean, it, it's it, you know it was all it was supposed to be there previously, but now being called out, I think is is, is great and and it is creating. A, a difference in terms of, of those approaches to, to investment and, and different regions. I think the Africa point is, is interesting because there it's uh, you know that you know the continent is you know huge amounts of investment needed. I think one of the things of COVID and uh, you know there's there's somewhat become a more a national view and, and and even when we're looking at equality, 
there is a tendency to to just look at in in our own countries and and, and solve that those points all very important but i think there there is a bit where we need to to also look at at wider regions and make sure that we are still doing that international support and and, and development agencies because that's going to be important in, 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 and and if we took at, at global equality that's going to be going to be an important piece um you know it's one of many many things that I, you know that that's that's on government's agendas um but it it, it is potentially as as we focus and doing all the right things in in, in the, the individual countries is whether we're doing you know making sure that that international focus remains uh, as well uh, is is going to be vital. Thanks, Michael. Ian, we started with you. I'm going to finish with you. Your thoughts on this kind of regional? Obviously, it's a big thing for the UK and leveling up. But your thoughts on that and equality in general? Thank you. Um, in view of time, I won't go for too long. But uh, I think I've made most of our points. Um, I think. Just, just to say, perhaps here it's, it's taken very, very seriously. I, I said it's an important part of our process. Um, in the same way as we report a balance sheet and we report a PL, we also report where we're doing deals, um, and we try to assess the strengths of the impact on the, on the local economy. So um, it is a very important, important feature for us. Yeah, thanks so much, Ian. Uh, sadly, we are out of time. Um, I would just like to say thanks to the audience for sending in your questions. We will have sent you a questionnaire as well. If you could take a few minutes just to fill that in, be hugely grateful. It means we can give you exactly the type of webinars that are most useful for you. And if you look on our website, you'll find details of all our upcoming webinars as well. Um, there's another one there on the 13th of October, um, all about adapting to climate impacts, but there's lots of other uh, webinars on our website. Um, thank you so much to our fantastic panel today, to Ian, to Chris, to Michael and Alexandra for lending us your time and your expertise. Really, really interesting and very topical uh, conversation. Thanks to Deloitte for being our knowledge partner today. Um, and just finally to say we will be sending a link to everyone who registered with the video from today. So you can watch it all again, you can share it with your colleagues. And in a couple of weeks time, we'll also be sending around an article that will have a write up of the key points uh, that were raised today. Just leaves me to say thank you to everybody, to our panel and to everyone watching. Enjoy the rest of the day wherever you are and we hope to see you again on another one of our webinars very soon. Thanks everybody and goodbye. Bye.